there is often a stigma when we speak about trauma as if you're looking at something bad, something dysfunctional, something we shouldn't have. And in fact, in the moment of strong overwhelm, the trauma response was a very necessary, intelligent function that saved us. Welcome to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel, a podcast that illuminates the path to collective healing at the intersection of science and mysticism. We will start today with some foundational definition and description of what I refer to when I say trauma. Because um, at the beginning of our exploration, it will be good that we are all on the same page when we use the word trauma. And we could say in a simple version, trauma is not the experience that we are going through that is overwhelming, painful, and overloading for our body, our nervous system, our emotional experience, our mental experience. But trauma is describing the response that happens within us, within a traumatizing situation. Because the trauma that we usually refer to or work with when we are looking at our own difficulties, issues, tensions, stress, and so forth, is actually a crystallized moment that happened usually in the past, either in my past, my childhood, in my ancestors' past, in the past of my culture and ancestors, or within a system of trauma that has been perpetuated and going on for thousands of years throughout uh, the history of humanity, where traumatizations happened and have been healed and integrated and happened again and so forth. So we are looking at the trauma response within our nervous systems, within our physical and psychological experiences. And when we zoom into that trauma response, we actually see that evolution put a very intelligent function in place. So throughout the evolution of life, because we are not the first ones that experienced some kind of trauma, our nervous systems developed a very intelligent function called trauma response. And when we are overwhelmed and overloaded strongly, we can split off a part of our internal experience through numbing, dissociating, and shutting down and freezing. And we can shut one part off that contains all the stress and, and some of the physical and emotional pain in order for us to survive better. And that's very important because like, there is often a stigma when we speak about trauma as if you're looking at something bad, something dysfunctional, something we shouldn't have. And in fact, in the moment of strong overwhelm, the trauma response was a very necessary, intelligent function that saved us, that helped us to survive better, that helped us to go through a situation uh, and still be able to function. Of course, after that situation or event or experience or series of experiences, we carry the after effects of that split and fragmentation within ourselves. And so the trauma response comes with dissociation numbing and fragmentation. And it also comes with an overload of stress, a hyperactivation. So I'm very stressed. I feel very strong emotions. And 
um, I'm kind of overloaded. So these two things, overload and hyperactivation, numbing and dissociation. And often I describe it with a um, with an image that I think shows the quality of trauma um, strongly. When you imagine you sit at home and you have a big TV screen and the TV screen shows a very noisy war situation and it's loud, it's loud. And then at a certain moment, you take the remote control and you mute the TV. It's still going on, but without sound, it's mute. So that's what we often experience in overwhelming moments. It's still going on, but it's like we become two-dimensional. We are like ghosts in a movie. We get the feeling we are experiencing life like when we watch a movie. So we disconnect from our body awareness, from our emotional experience, we pull back in either or we disembody and we numb ourselves. So it's not that painful, like an anesthesia. That's where we are, like an anesthesia. So it's like an anesthesia that shuts down the pain that is too overwhelming. That's why it becomes a bit like ghosty. And in our Developmental model, we call this like the 2D state. Life suddenly becomes two-dimensional. It's not anymore three-dimensional and direct. It's a bit like a ghost. And so, and if we deepen that experience, so then we can say we take the TV and we throw it into the ocean. And slowly you still see the war scene going on and it's drowning, it's dropping into the ocean. And there's a certain moment when you don't see it anymore. So that split of hyperactivated part drowns in the ocean of the subconscious. And that's where it rests. And today, on the bottom of the ocean, there are many TVs in the collective unconscious, the collection of all our trauma dissociations is still going on. Those scenes are still playing, but without our awareness. And the scenes of our ancestors are still playing without our awareness. And all of that describes, in a way, what we might experience as symptoms when we are met by life, and we call it in triggering moments, when old trauma that hasn't been integrated yet gets triggered. We might feel either disconnected, indifferent, numb, frozen, unable to respond to the current situation appropriately, or we feel hyperactivated, hyperfearful, hyperemotional, hyperstressed, and often small situations in daily life can induce a massive response or reaction that is not in alignment with what the situation actually needs. So either I'm too numb and too disconnected, or I'm overactivated and overreactive. But I can't find a regulated middle path, like a relational response to the situation. That's why we discern between reactivity as a, as a, reaction before I actually could feel the experience fully. And the responsiveness means I experience and feel the moment, and then I respond to it. These are two very different states of being and dealing with a situation. Reactivity is 
I experience a triggered situation. I shut down. I feel the shutdown that I carry inside or the stress. And I react before I really experience the situation, the person, the moment, the life circumstance fully. So I can't respond with my full capacity. So I'm reactive. And I guess we all know reactive moments in our life versus responsive moments. Responsive moments have space, have awareness, and we respond usually from a place of listening, digesting, responding, acting. So when I'm reactive, I'm using behaviors and reactions that I replayed already many times. When I respond, my inspiration, my intuition, my presence are part of the situation. I'm staying related. When I'm reactive, I'm not related anymore. I don't feel the person anymore. I don't feel maybe myself anymore. And I don't have my higher capacities of intuition and inspiration or innovation online. So I'm reacting informed by my past versus responding is that the present moment, my relatedness to you, and my inspiration can inform the moment, which means I, there's a much higher chance to be creative, to find solutions, to be able to create updates to certain situations. It's more spontaneous, it's emergent, it's sometimes surprising, and it's most of all, it's in relation to what's happening. In my reactive moments, I'm in relation with my unintegrated past. And, and that's important because when we have reactive moments and we let them pass by unexamined or we judge ourselves, we say, oh, I shouldn't have done this and why did I do this and now I feel guilty and now uh, I'm very critical with myself and I'm judgmental, then I actually miss totally the message of the situation. But if I say, yes, I have been triggered, I was reactive in an intimate relationship conversation at work, in society, and I come back in a, after some time and I can make space in my life, in the evening or when I have space later on the day and I reflect on the reactive moment and say, okay, I, I touched my own unintegrated past. So the feelings that informed me were not just feelings concerning that situation, but was kind of a reactivation of my past. So suddenly I felt angry or suddenly I felt very fearful or suddenly I felt very sad or ashamed because the current moment touched my unintegrated past. So one um, foundational teaching is about reactivity informed by the past and a signpost post to trauma responsiveness informed by the present moment and the emergence of the future is informed by the relation to the current experience and the current moment. So the one speaks the past, the other one speaks presence and the future. And, and that's very important because if we step-by-step step, turn, use the teaching that reactive moments hold and transform them into relatedness. First of all, we will have more responsive moments in our life, but also we will use the signs of life to heal. So in reactive moments, I can get to know my shadow landscape. In reactive moments, I get to know my trauma landscape. 
And that's fantastic because if I can slowly relax the judgmental part of myself, the critical part of myself, and say, wow, there is a learning here possible. I can learn within those moments or after those moments, I can learn something deeper about myself and I can uncover what I can't see, what is hidden, what is unconscious to my current awareness. And the other part is also that unintegratedness. As you remember, I spoke before about there's an overwhelming experience. I needed to split off one part that holds the whole overwhelm so that the rest of my self can still be engaged and act or run away or do something. So that part is now a split of bubble in myself. That's what gets triggered in a reactive moment. And it's information that at that point in time gets frozen here. So these trauma fragmentations live inside of myself or everybody on the level where they have been created. So if somebody gets traumatized at age five, the trauma fragmentation lives in the nervous system on the level of the development of age five. Somebody gets traumatized in school at age 12 through mobbing, then the trauma lives on a different level of development. For the healing and the integration process, that's important because we see sometimes we react like a three-year-old or a five-year-old or a 10-year-old. So then we are grown up human beings, but our reactivity shows emotional patterns, behaviors that are much younger than my current state and the age that my passport says. And so for the <clears throat> understanding of trauma, we can uh, summarize a little bit that we said trauma is actually a trauma response to an overwhelming, traumatizing situation. And it consists usually out of two elements, a dissociated, numbed, and shut down part, a hyperactivated, highly stressed and highly emotional part. So it creates in a way two. And, and that's also what we can suffer from is that we either, in, when it gets triggered, we become numb, we become, we feel disconnected. We don't feel anymore as part of the current experience or we feel hyperreactive and we overreact in moments that actually don't need that uh, strong um, emotional or stress response. And um, so uh, my past speaks. And that's why we often run into difficulties because that creates side effects in our lives, in our partnerships, in our relationships with colleagues and um, in our society. The other part is that when we speak about trauma, of course, there is shock trauma. That's what happens to us when an accident happens or an injury happens. So then there is trauma, but trauma has a much more complex and sophisticated dimension and the attachment process. When we grow up as kids, we all know attachment trauma. And then We go deeper, and of course, attachment trauma also includes prenatal traumatization. But then there is transgenerational trauma transmission that when ancestors got traumatized and they pass on the trauma through epigenetics and genetics, and then also through of course, the attachment process that the parents are able to provide. 
So we carry it actually in the transgenerational communication that our genetic and epigenetic environment is representing. So there's a transgenerational data flow that communicates all the skills, all the resources, all the learning of humanity and life so far. But it also communicates hurts and, and high stress levels and, and uh, different hormonal balances and receptors. And so it's a, it's a very sophisticated form of communicating life from one generation to the next. And then there is historic trauma. This is that a, 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 maybe a whole population of a state or an ethnicity went through a massive traumatization. So a whole collective has been affected, which includes individual trauma, but also the fact that the, the collective experienced it together um, has an amplifying effect. And then we talk about um, the dimension of collective trauma in the sense of the syndemic or the system's effect of trauma that has been going on for thousands of years and that we have been born into a world that um, has integrated structures of consciousness in ourselves and society, but also carries trauma structures or frozen elements that also look like structures to us because that's the world we get to know when we grow up in it. But actually those are not functional structures of consciousness. These are frozen elements of past unintegrated elements that are not able to fully participate in the evolutionary emergence. And that's why they create symptoms. And I believe that's a short overview. As we all know, trauma is such a huge landscape and there's more and more material and there are more and more studies out there and um, in various disciplines many people study trauma and the physiological the psychological the societal aspects of trauma so that's amazing because like that we we deepen very very quickly our understanding neuroscience and so on uh, one more thing is not to forget that even if i um, showed now the, the whole landscape of trauma that we are not the first ones coming into life and we are not the first ones experiencing uh, overwhelming situations. And that means that we are also embodying the resilience and the strength and the capacity to heal ourselves that our ancestors passed on to us. And I think that's very important as well, that there is already a strength and a self-healing mechanism active in us that comes through thousands and thousands of years of integration and healing and the immune system being active and being taught and the collective immune system being active and taught in order to be the ones that are relating to this world today. And so we have both. We have the strength of our ancestry and we also carry the wounds of our ancestry in order to support those wounds to heal and turn into wisdom. Visit CollectiveTraumaSummit.com to listen to more talks like this one and to learn more. Thanks for listening to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel. Stay connected and get updates about new episodes by visiting our website, PointOfRelationPodcast.com, and by subscribing to the Thomas Hubel YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share about us with your community on social media. Thank you. We appreciate your support.